Look, welcome everybody to 1483. That's meeting 1483. Look, this meeting is devoted to policing. You've all heard of George Floyd and Bianca Taylor. But I'm going to tell you about something that probably slipped under the radar. And it would attract my attention because I'm a product of the lynching era. I go back a long time. A monumental piece of legislation passed on September 27th. 2020, HR 35, the Elizabeth, the Emmett Till anti-lynching bill. Took 200 attempts to pass this bill. It passed 65 years later after the lynching of Emmett Till. Let me tell you about it. Emmett Till was a native of Chicago. His mother sent him to Mississippi to visit some cousins. Okay. While there, he went to a grocery store to buy some candy for his cousins. The store was owned by a white man and his wife. His wife waited on Emmett Till, gave him the candy, he paid for it. He went out with his cousins, joined them, and shared the candy. For some reason that we don't, we'll never know. She followed him out of that grocery store. He's with his friends. Well, she told her husband that he whistled at her. Now, listen, the truth of the matter is he did whistle. Yes, he did. It, it was worse. See, Emmett Till, like Joe Biden, was a stutterer. And his mother told him that the way to cure stuttering was to stop when you run into a word you can't say. Stop. And take a deep breath and whistle, and you'll be able to make the word. Well, the woman carried the story back to her husband and told her husband that Emmett Till, the 14-year-old boy, whistled there. That was enough for Billy to get Joe and go after Emmett Till, and they did. Armed with weapons, they captured him, and uh, brutalized him, gouged out his eyes, other things that I'm not going to mention, hung him for all to see, and then threw him in the Chattahoochee River. That was in 1955. Congress tied, tried for 200 different attempts over the years to pass an anti-lynching bill. They never could do it. Until 65 years later, The Emmett Till bill was introduced into the House and passed 410 to 4. 
four negative votes. It was then introduced to the Senate that Kamala Harris, Cory Booker, and Tim Scott. It passed unanimously. And H.R. 35 was signed into law on February 27, 20. That was a piece of federal legislation. Now, what's happening on the state and local level? Today, we got two sons of Connecticut to come here and tell us what's happening in Connecticut, what's happening in the nation's capital, and what should be happening in the federal government. You see, in this case of Emmett too, the president at the time, Dwight Eisenhower, was disturbed over this murder. And he threatened to send the FBI down there because he said, nobody should be killed over a whistle. So the police had to make up an excuse. They made up a story. The 14 year old attacked this woman. And therefore, the, the men were justified. They were brought to trial, acquitted, state law. They were free and innocent. No federal laws could touch them. So we must know now what our state laws are doing and what the future holds for us. We got two sons of Connecticut. They know each other. We're lucky to have them. They're gonna discuss what's going on with us for this country. Now, I turn the meeting over to you. It's up to you to introduce our first speaker, Mike D'Agostino. Okay, Quintus. Read off this profile? Yes, ma'am. Um, Rep. Mike D. Agostino. Am I saying that right? That's correct. Was a member of Hamden's Board of Education for 13 years and served as a chairperson from 2005 to 2012. As a former Board of Education member, Rep. D. Agostino has spearheaded legislative efforts to change how Connecticut schools are funded. His efforts led to such changes in 2017 legislative session as the state adopted a new education aid formula. Rep. D. Agostino was elected to serve Hamden's 91st District House seat in the Connecticut House of Representatives in November 2012 and was just recently elected to his fifth two-year term, two term. Rep. D. Agostino serves as an assistant to majority whip and is a chairman of the General Law Committee with an active interest in policing. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Great, terrific. I want to thank you all for the invite. Uh, thank Greg and and say hello to say hello to Jeff in particular. It's nice to be reunited with him, at least virtually. We're both uh, Hamden High grads, and Jeff, I'm looking forward to the next time you're up, and hopefully in a post-COVID world, we can get together. We can have you up to testify live, actually, at the at the Connecticut General <laughs> Assembly. All the all the great work you're doing. Oh wow! At DC, which we're going to hear about. Oh, that would be um, great. Well, thank you. I think I really think your perspective would be tremendous for a lot of different reasons, um, not just from your background, but from what you're working on right now. So uh, we'll we'll make that happen, and I'm looking forward to seeing you the next time you're back up, hopefully soon. Um, I wanted to uh, touch base. Greg asked me to touch base about the police accountability bill that uh, Connecticut recently passed in a special session this summer. 
and it's very comprehensive. And what I'll do is I'll circulate after this meeting a summary of it uh, so folks can go through it. It's fairly interactive. You click on a section and it gives you the summary. It's a nice piece of um, literature to have if you're interested in going through the whole, the whole thing. But I wanted to touch on some particular aspects of that law because in many respects, I think they are um, sort of state leading uh, elements that I'd, I'd like to see implemented in other states, certainly, but um, we're, we're sort of going through a little bit of an experiment here in Connecticut on this, and and a lot of these changes are, are worth you knowing about. Um, and obviously I'm interested in getting Jeff's perspective as well. I'm gonna save for the end of my few minutes uh, the, the qualified immunity piece, because that kind of got the most attention and sucked a lot of the oxygen out of the room. But to me, it actually wasn't the most important piece of the bill. It was the headline piece, but it wasn't the most important piece uh, where we circumscribed um, uh, the, the uh, qualified immunity under state law. I'll come back to that. But one piece of this bill that didn't get a lot of attention that is incredibly important has to do with police officer certification. Every municipal police officer in Connecticut and now the state police have to be certified in order to be a police officer, be a law enforcement officer in Connecticut through something called the Post Council, the Police Officer Standards and Training Council, which is a separately quasi governmental uh, body that certifies police officers and state police officers. You hear a lot every time there's an officer involved shooting or law enforcement uh, uh, violence um, that the uh, officer involved uh, very often is suspended without pay or suspended with pay and it may take uh, months or frankly even years for um, a municipality to be able to dismiss that officer because of collective bargaining. Now I'm a big supporter of collective bargaining, but that is obviously not right, especially if someone has been um, found to have engaged in an excessive or unjustified force. What this law did is it allows the, the certification panel to decertify an officer um, based on excessive or unjustified use of force or uh, for failing to take and pass a, a, a drug test as a condition of renewing their certification. Um, that is effectively a way around a lot of those administrative hurdles that often get thrown up in the way of dismissing um, we hear the stories all the time about um, uh, officers who repeatedly are offenders and because of collective bargaining rights are able to stay on the force. This is now a separate mechanism that allows an officer to be decertified. And if you don't have a certification, you can't be a law enforcement officer in Connecticut, period, full stop. Doesn't matter what your collective bargaining agreement says, doesn't matter what whatever else exists in the law. Um, that certification is key. That is new. That didn't get a lot of attention, but it's obviously, as you can imagine, very important. We in Hamden are, are going through a process right now. Um, I don't know if Jeff followed this at all or, or any of you followed this at all, where an officer um, fired, just, ran, you know, pulled somebody over to stop and discharged his weapon like 10 or 11 times uh, while, while retreating. Um, it was in incredibly uh, dangerous. The, the suspect was not armed, was not committing any kind of crime, was just uh, simply being pulled over. And uh, in the course of getting out of the car, uh, the officer felt somehow threatened and just started firing. And, and that officer has been found to have violated every single standard. The town has settled a lawsuit related to it, and yet he's still on the force because of the collective bargaining. This will change that. So that certification piece was very important and, and not everybody was aware of it. So I wanted to note it for you. There's many other pieces of this law. I want to touch on a few of them before I get to the qualified immunity piece. Um, there are now regular behavioral health assessments for police officers under this, this law. Um, implicit bias training is required for police officers under this law. Um, there are uh, There is now established, and this was also very important, an officer of the inspector general, a separate state agency to investigate officer-involved shootings or allegations of excessive force. No longer is it the state prosecutor's office that will be doing that because we felt we wanted another level of independence away from the law enforcement um, uh, paradigm and structure to independently investigate those kind of allegations. That's brand new. That's very important. 
We've put limits on consent searches now. It used to be if you pull somebody over in Connecticut and the officer says, can I search your car and somebody consents, that's all you needed, you could do it. Now we are still we are requiring probable cause in addition to personal consent. That's very important because it it prevents a lot of abuse in, when, when you see people being sort of, um, you know, pulled over, you know, parochially, obviously, you know, driving all black, that sort of thing. We're, we're, now, we're now ingraining in the law prohibitions on that. Um, we've also established, uh, uh, we've, we've passed, part of this law allows now every municipality in, in the state to create a civilian review board. That's something that didn't exist previously. Doesn't mean they're all going to have it, but now they are all empowered to have it. That was very piecemeal before, and we didn't have that. Um, we're banning police from using and buying military equipment. That was another thing that got a lot of headlines that we're not going to allow anymore. Um, the qualified immunity piece, let me just spend a couple minutes on that because this got a lot of the attention. We are, we didn't, let me just sort of start with that. In, in federal law, um, there is qualified immunity for state actors. If you're, if, you're, if you're acting under a good faith basis and belief that what you're doing complies with the law, you can be immune from suit as a police officer. Um, that law has evolved over the years. It's gotten more and more difficult uh, under the law to bring suits against officers uh, because they claim qualified immunity. What we did here is we didn't get rid of qualified immunity for all officer-involved conduct, but we created a state law cause of action that essentially returns qualified immunity to the original legal concept that was in existence originally for 20 years, from 1967 to the early 1980s, which only protected officers if they had a good faith basis for believing that what they were doing was right. And it exempts from immunity any malicious or wanton conduct. If you, if you know what you're doing is wrong uh, by an objective standard, um, you should be liable for that. I'll come back to the liability piece in a second. But, but so what we did is we said, you can be sued under state law. You, you can still avail yourself of qualified immunity if you had a good faith basis for believing what you're doing is right. But we're getting rid of a lot of the different um, other constraints on qualified immunity that were put in to, to, that really have prevented, frankly, outrageous cases of police misconduct uh, in federal law. We've gotten rid of that and said, no, no, if, if, you, if you behave that out outrageously, you can be directly liable under state law. I say directly liable, and this is important. Um, as a compromise to get the bill passed, what we also did, though, is we required municipalities to maintain insurance for their officers. And so at the end of the day, if an officer acts egregiously and is found liable under this new state law, the municipality will pay. And then the municipality can seek to recoup any payments from the individual officer. But the plaintiff does not get the money directly from the officer. We actually felt that that was important because it puts the onus on the municipalities to appropriately train and oversee their police force. They have skin in the game. They will be directly liable for those payments in the first instance if one of their officers isn't properly trained or if they keep putting uh, an offender, known offender back out there, they'll be liable under this. So we felt from an incentive standpoint, that made a lot of sense. Uh, but it seems a little counterintuitive at first to say, wait a minute, you're suing the officer, don't they have to pay? They pay if the municipality pays and then goes after, they can go after the officer directly. Frankly, and, and Jeff knows this as a lawyer, um, you know, in order to, to make sure this litigation kind of works, you, you want a pocket at the end of the day, uh, you know, suing a police officer, you know, most important thing is to get that police officer out. Um, the recompense should come from a, a pocket that can play, pay it and that ultimately is also responsible for pay for for uh, training that officer. So that's what we did with qualified immunity. Um, and then in the last couple of minutes, I just wanna, I just wanna mention this. Um, the politics here are just as important as the policy. And I wanted to just make you all aware of just sort of how this all came about, because I think it's important to have some overall context. Um, you know, there's a democratic majority in the Connecticut House, Connecticut Senate, and obviously we have the governor. 
We did not try to ram this through, though. Um, every step of the way, the Republican leadership in Connecticut was at the table negotiating changes to this bill. And in fact, those, some of those changes to qualified immunity I just mentioned were based on discussions with the Republican leadership. Um, now, you're getting this from a Democrat here, so take it from whatever it's worth. You're not getting the other side of it. But I will say, factually, um, they were at the table, and at the, at the last minute, um, they pulled support, and only one out of more than 60 Republican reg legislators in the House and Senate combined, only one voted for it. Um, that left kind of a bitter taste in some of our mouths because then they turned around and campaigned against Democrats in the down ballot races this time as being anti police, which we didn't feel we were. We felt like this was a real bipartisan bill. And I think at the end of the day, the product was why none of them felt they could put their name to it when they were part of the negotiations. I don't, I don't know. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how that affects future uh, bills and future evolution of these laws. Um, uh, you know, I don't know if we'll, we'll, I don't know, we'll have to see how that happens, but I throw it out there just so you know sort of the, both the politics and the policy that, that surrounded this bill. Uh, but at the end of the day, we're very proud of it. Um, it passed. Most of it has gone into effect already. The qualified immunity piece goes into effect uh, in July. We wanted to give time for that to be put into effect and make sure that there was insurance coverage across the board. Um, and one final piece that I forgot to mention also, we required, we mandated body cameras and dashboard cameras and provided $4 million of funding to make sure that happens in every municipal police force in the state of Connecticut. So very comprehensive bill. And uh, I'll pass it back to, to you guys. I think Jeff uh, obviously has got some pieces that he'll, he'll talk about. I don't know. I think we'll probably take questions after, after he's done. So that's my, my piece uh, on uh, Connecticut's uh, very uh, important uh, uh, new law on police accountability. Well, Mike, that was great. I'm not sure whether, you know, where, uh, where I'm supposed to sort of jump in, but I thought, uh, I thought that was really great. And Connecticut is, uh, you know, is doing a lot of good stuff. Qualified immunity is so hard to explain. I thought you did a, uh, you know, an excellent job of, uh, of breaking that down. My internet cut out for a minute. So one thing I don't know whether I heard or not, but one thing that goes on just on that issue before I get to some things I'm working on is that basically we're all paying, you know, we're kind of all paying anyway into the system. So I think having to get the insurance and having that sort of accountability there for, you know, for officers, you know, who make a mistake and, you know, almost going to the more of the model that lawyers have, which is, you know, if you're, I mean, if you're a bad lawyer and you make repeated mistakes, even if I do it in Connecticut, I'm not just going to be able to go with, and, you know, be able to move to another town in Connecticut or just move to Washington, D.C. and nobody's going to, um, you know, nobody's going to sort of recognize, you know, what, what I've done. So I think professionalizing policing in that way is, uh, is, is really important. I, I am now sort of seeing that I need to, you know, stop here before, uh, you know, and get, get introduced before, uh, before commenting. You know, I got too excited. Right. So I will, uh, I will do that now. <laughs> no, we wanted to make sure that your mother was able to introduce you. And so she's going to do the honor in reading your, um, your bio to the group. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> Where is she? I'm just going to make sure I unmute her first. Okay, unmute her. Eleanor, you might have to unmute yourself because it's not allowing me to. Okay. Try that one more time. Okay. Uh, Jeff, welcome to CAS and CAS members. It is a delight for me to introduce my son to you. Uh, Jeff H. Tignor attended Hamden High School, Harvard, and Duke Law. He is a lawyer at the Federal Communications Commission. He is also an advisor on law and technology to the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice at Harvard Law School. Jeff is also the former elected chairman of an advisory neighborhood commission in DC, often working on issues affecting public safety. He is presently the only African-American serving on the police review board of the nation's capital. The Washington Post has published several 
of his op-eds on policing. So Jeff, now you're on. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you for that uh, very, very generous uh, introduction. Uh, it's great. I mean, I think that it's really great that, you know, Mike introduced so many topics. So I will try to, you know, focus on some things that, uh, that sort of dovetail with some of the issues that, 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 that he raised. And I, I would say that DC also came out with some police reform uh, legislation not too long ago. I put a link to, uh, to that over there in the, in the chat. You can click on it and see some of the items that were mentioned. Some of the items are very similar to things that were uh, that have happened in Connecticut, and I can touch on those. Uh, in other ways, DC already had some mechanisms in place, I think, before. So we kind of added to some of the things that we were doing. Uh, the other link I put in the chat is for uh, just to the Office of Police Complaints, and we can uh, we'll talk about we'll talk about that. So, um, but I think that maybe the easiest thing is really just to pick up from some places where uh, where Mike left off. And so. One thing that uh, DC has done to sort of increase police accountability is to have set up a, uh, an Office of Police Complaints, which is an independent agency uh, that's part of the DC government. So the mayor is not you know, basically overseeing the head of the Office of Police Complaints. Uh, actually, the board members, I'm one of the people on this five member board. There are four civilians and one police, uh, police person, policewoman. Uh, that's going to be changing soon. And the number is going to be increased as part of the um, legislation that just came out. But that independent office, which has been in, in existence since the 90s, uh, reviews every complaint that a uh, citizen files you know, against the police officer in Washington, D.C. And I, I think the, the purpose of the office, or the stated purpose, is always to improve police and community relations. And I think when you look at some of the you know, issues that, that Mike discussed, maybe having this complaint process in is, is another way of going about solving these. So you have legislative fixes, you have, you, know, you have rules and regulations that the police officers have to follow, you have federal law, but you, know, you want all these things kind of working together. So you've got, so all forms of the regulation, sort of state, federal, you know, municipal rules for police, I think all these things really, really work together. And so the Office of Police Complaints uh, reviews every complaint against a uh, police officer. They, it has investigators um, on the staff, and, um, and there are basically, they, will, they, will invest, they investigate everything that happens, review the complaint, they interview the officers, they have the ability to require the officers to come in for an interview. Uh, right now during the pandemic, uh, those, some took place over Zoom, but I think the officers won a, um, a union right to uh, be, you know, to have these meetings be in person. So that was something that was interesting and probably um, slowed things down a little bit for us, uh, you know, during the summer. But everybody has kind of accommodated, uh, you know, with that, with that and got, got used to things. And so the cases will be, you know, reviewed. Um, and basically for a case to be dismissed, uh, one board member has to uh, assent to the dismissal. So that means that we have a rotation system where we read the complaints and we review the, all the ones that are proposed uh, to be dismissed. And then pretty much we work with, the, the board member will work with the executive director um, of the office to, uh, you know, if there are any questions like, oh, why are we dismissing this? Oh, there's additional facts we really, you know, that could have been added to a complaint. Uh, you know, before it's dismissed, because, you know, it's dismissed, it goes back to, uh, you know, goes back to the public, and, you know, everybody's able to, you know, read and see these, and, and there's a full recitation of, you know, of the, of the facts. I mean, there's uh, body-worn cameras have been required in D.C. now for several years, so, and they're required to be turned on. It's just a violation if you do not have your camera on, so in a lot of cases, there's maybe a little less interviewing that has to happen now, because there might be four officers there, who saw um, who saw exactly what happened, you know, on on a body on a body worn camera. So I think that has been very helpful. You know, that doesn't necessarily settle everything. I think when we get to incidents, you know, that was like Mike just described with with the shoot with the shooting, I think that becomes um, you know those become very very difficult. Um, DC already has a separate independent uh, review board for uh, for shootings, and the head of the Office of Police Complaints is a member of that board along with some. I think there's maybe some law enforcement officials maybe some retired law enforcement so it's a more it's a more independent body and that and that group reviews um, you know every shooting so people if there is, is a shooting I think a person doesn't even need to file a complaint that is going to get a, a separate review um, one of the things that happened in uh, in, in DC's legislation was if there is a shooting all body worn camera footage needs to be uh, placed you know basically out the public needs to see it within 72 hours and so there was um, one particular shooting, I think this fall or late summer after this came out, 
and that um, you know that footage did come out, and I mean the the footage you know was on Twitter, and it became people were it was you know it was just uh you know I think probably a close call probably in many people's minds as to whether that was sort of uh, justified or not. I believe ultimately it was found to be justified, but you, you just find out how um, I think seeing that finds out how difficult these situations are and as Mike pointed out how important you know bipartisan compromise and hearing all perspectives you know really is because I mean people are unfortunately you know making sort of life and death decisions at so um, you know just in, in a split second I mean really after looking at that and thinking about this situation so I'm just like reminded that there's just probably too many you know guns in our society but that's kind of a separate uh, sort of a separate point. But I, uh, but anyway, our um, our office, you know, with this independent director, actually one of the things we did recently was we um, we reappointed our independent director for three more years. So the board member, the board had to review his uh, contract and sign him to a new contract, and he really is fabulous. Uh, Mike Tobin, he has, you know, he was in the military, he was a police officer, he was um, he headed Milwaukee's basically office of police complaints previously. He's just a really a really thoughtful guy um, involved in just an organization, NACOL, National Association. Um, for oversight of law, law enforcement oversight. I can't remember exactly what the acronym is, but we're actively involved with that. So you have people from DC who are doing trainings with people from other cities and trying to get involved and trying to understand, you know, best, you know, best practices. Um, in terms of sort of my involvement, as uh, the bio pointed out, I was a, I was a part-time elected official, you know, in, in DC. So while I'm a lawyer, I could really hold this nonpartisan position. So I was the you know chair of kind of a midi city council in our part of DC, and got to know the in mayor during that you know time frame, or the now mayor during that time frame. She had a similar role at the time, and uh, and so really she asked me to be on this commission. I think I want to say in 2018, toward the end of the year, and I thought she was just looking for somebody who didn't have a background in in policing, you know, no kind of no police in the family, not working in law enforcement or nonprofit work on policing, just to come with an, an independent uh, perspective. And so I had to be, you know, approved by the uh, by the city council, you know, for this role. And, and it was it was interesting. It was not uh, it was not an easy confirmation. They um, the head of the public safety committee, I think, saw you know my background being a lawyer and having been an you know, elected official, and probably figured out to be pro police. Which is, uh, or you know, which 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 was interesting. So we had, you know, a full, you know, back and forth. And the mayor's office had me well prepared, but they ended up, you know, sort of approving me, uh, you know, for the for the position. And I think I just think it's it's such an important uh, role. I could probably put a link to my post op-ed um, over there in the chat if I get a chance. But I think really having independent people, just regular citizens, you know, offering their opinions on this is on, on these policing issues is really really important. I, I think that you know the police really need to. This is what was in my op-ed. Really need to reflect their their local community. You need officers who come. You know, they don't all have to be from Hamden or from New Haven, but from the area. And I think that's one of the things that DC has done best and is doing pretty well. So many of the officers are from DC or Maryland that they, they know who the people are who they're policing. You know, I'm like this, say they know them personally, but they have a sense of, I'm in this neighborhood, these are the people who are there. And, and I think it takes away, you know, some of the issues that you saw, like, you know, in Minneapolis, you know, George, George Floyd's killer, he, he was a Florida resident. So, you know, he wasn't even, he wasn't even a part of that community. He was just, you know, he was in Florida for taxes. So that's kind of tells you his level of investment in the area. And I think that's the kind of thing that, you know, having officers who are from the community and understand it's very important. And then having, you know, just regular people who are there to take a look and, you know, double check and back up the investigators, you know, is really, it's just, you know, it's very important. It doesn't put everything on the legislature or anything when it's very hard, you know, to get something through and to count on politics, you know, solving a problem. I mean, our board is, you know, completely just is nonpartisan. It's people, from sort of all different, uh, all different, you know, walks of life who, who take a look at this. And uh, so one thing that has happened in, in DC is that our board currently has five members. And so, you know, four, four civilians, one policewoman, and this new police reform legislation has eliminated the position that's held by the policewoman. And just said, there'll be no police on the civilian review board. Uh, you know, our office of police complaints, we call it. And instead, they're going to be representatives from each of the, their eight wards, you know, eight sections of Washington, D.C. Each ward will have a uh, representative, plus there'll be one at-large member. And so I, I think this is a, you know, this, this, is, a, a, this is, a good, is a good system, I, I think, linking, you know, linking people and their, uh, people linking people in the neighborhoods together a little more closely. Um, one thing that it will, it will guarantee is that in, in D.C., 
you know, I think like every area probably has neighborhoods or parts that are maybe over policed or there's a lot more policing. And so we'll guarantee that there are representatives from those areas um, on the board. I think they're currently, I think we do currently have, uh, you know, maybe one representative, but I think it will ensure that that perspective is there. And then I think this things we'll have to work through or if an incident happens in one person's area, you know, does that, you know, commissioner take a little bit more of an interest in it, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe not. Uh, I had some conversation with the, uh, you know, with the director about that. So I think those are those are some things that that we'll think about. But um, I'll just tell you just a couple more things. Maybe definitely some question and answers, and you know, back and forth. Mike, I feel like would be helpful at this point. But our our role again is just reviewing the um, reviewing each complaint sort of before it's uh, dismissed. And I'll say some of the types of complaints that I think we see that you know have tended to be problematic and that. And where action has been taken. So basically, our, anyways, our board. So I guess I focus, sorry, on the dismissal side of it. But if a complaint is upheld, basically what will happen is we'll go through the process of uh, the investigation will take place. There'll be a complaint examiner who's maybe a law professor from Georgetown, an independent person again, will take a look at everything that's been submitted by the investigator following the interviews. And basically, like a like a judge, they will you know write an opinion that says you know yes. There are violations of, you know, the Constitution here. You know, here's the federal case law. There are violations of, you know, MPD rules, uh, Metropolitan Police Department rules. There might have been a violation of some state law. And so we are upholding this complaint. It will then be up to the police department to uh, implement discipline. And, and I think that's where we've potentially seen some issues and maybe a place for some additional uh, legislation. Our, our organization has made some recommendations uh, basically saying that the police complaints board and the police department should work jointly on discipline for um, cases that uh, come up through the office of police complaints. There are you know, separate cases that come up against the officers that will just come up through MPD, through the police department. But for cases brought by a civilian, you know, our, our belief is that the civilians should have some role in, in the bottom line you know, discipline. As it stands, the police chief, who actually our Washington DC police chief just left to uh, take a job in suburban Virginia, whether that's related to this new legislation and something, you know, it's kind of hard to say, but it, it's probably not a coincidence. Um, so DC will be hiring a new police chief. But you know, hopefully, there's a hope that maybe that person can work more closely with our board, which would probably require, you know, would require the city council, um, you know, passing new legislation. But to where the the final discipline really is a joint um, is a joint effort, because you know we've been finding that sometimes where we'll make a recommendation of, you know, some type of firm discipline. I think there's you know there are kind of a couple lines. There's a line that's going to require at least a suspension, a fine, you know, something, some type of hard discipline, and once we've gone through the complaint examiner and a lot of times recently the police chief has been saying well you know it's just been giving you know a, a reprimand which i would probably have to really say is a strongly worded letter um I, I think that the police officers would disagree and say that when something negative like that goes with your file it's really meaningful but i think we've had some concerns it's still that that's reserved for the other things that maybe didn't go through to the complaint examiner, but just were handled under a slightly lesser process, like not turning on your body worn camera. That might be handled through additional education, through a letter, you know, especially if you have done it multiple times. But if you get to something more serious, then that really does probably merit a suspension, a fine, a loss of vacation time. And I feel like the most common things that we see, and then I will uh, stop talking, are things like a stop being extended for too long a period of time. You know, a person is stopped, maybe they have tinted windows, that's something we see a decent amount of. But then somehow the police never go and actually get the machine to tell whether the tint is over the line or not. They stop, they look up the license plate. You know, they, they, you know, keep them there for 45 minutes, nothing really happens, ask a bunch of questions, run their license. You know, and, and we found that those who, in a couple of cases, have mounted to, well, you know, he was somebody who I saw with these people who I know were engaged in, you know, maybe some illegal activity or, or I thought that, or in one case, it was somebody who might have done something, you know, three or four years ago, but was long out of any, you know, interaction with, with, with law enforcement, but they're just kept there. And, you know, it's, it's, just, it's unconstitutional just to stop somebody without probable cause and hold them there. In some of these cases, the person, you know, said, can I go? You know, and then and they just, you know, were told, you know, no, or just given no answer at all. I think the other, you know, cases, I mean, these are probably the most obvious things, you know, on searches, you know, unlawful searches. Um, a person says, you know, roll down your window. I want to look in your car. I said, no, you know, you don't have consent to do that. 
police officer shines their light in anyway or breaks a window anyway. And, you know, those, those are things which are you know, just, you know, violations. I mean, it's possible if you want that search, you have to go to court, get a warrant or get the individual's consent. And so I think that you, um, so those are, those are common issues that we have. And then, you know, one other piece that I think has really stood out to me on this and, you know, Mike already touched on it is really the, the mental health side of this. And it's really from both, um, from both angles. I mean, a lot of the complaints we end up dismissing are people who clearly, I mean, citizens who clearly have some, you know, some mental health issues. They think the police car, you know, is following them all around the city and there's just, you know, there's no basis for it. The officers are interviewed. They, they don't know who the person is. And I think on the other side of it, you know, you have officers as the one who was, you know, retreating while firing, you know, as, as Mike described, uh, there was one I read recently where an, an officer became concerned. There was a husband and wife, or I think, or a boyfriend and girlfriend. The girlfriend had been pulled over. Her tag was, it was in front of their house. Her tag was out of date. And then he, you know, came outside or something. And, she, and this officer became very, very concerned and said, oh, you know, domestic violence. This is when, you know, things oftentimes will, you know, go wrong in a situation. And this person was standing on his property, being respectful, not doing anything, found himself handcuffed. And so, you know, I think these are, you know, these are situations where, you know, some additional sort of training, I think, uh, you know, some additional training really could be helpful just so that the, um, you know, the officers are, you know, of course, understanding the constitution, but just not blindly saying, well, and this, this guy said a combination of a traffic stop and domestic violence is where, you know, problems occur and there was no domestic violence and the traffic stop should have just been resolved simply by giving a ticket, yet it became, you know, just this hour long ordeal. And so I think these are, you know, these are some of the issues that um, I guess to kind of go full circle, you know, plague and make difficult uh, community trust. And that's a, really the purpose of our organization is to build community trust. And I think when you have people wrongfully stopped and these other types of things that makes that hard to build. And, and you know, we need, we need community trust so the people, especially in Washington, D.C., so that people can protest, people can come from outside and protest, and that it's no problem and that, you know, everybody's, you know, First Amendment, you know, rights are respected. So, I realize I probably went on far too long, but uh, you know, thanks again. You know, thanks to you guys for having me, and uh, certainly, just like Mike, I'm happy to answer any questions. So we have two questions from Monica um, to CT Rep. This is in regards to the certification for the policing. How much is it based on community policing? And then to you, Jeff, um, you said five people sit on your review board. Explain what the makeup of that board looks like. And then I was just getting ready to type my question, so let me put that in there. But I'm, I'm interested if there are any efforts around educating uh, citizens on what their rights are, um, if there's any efforts going around that, because I feel like uh, a lot of these um, you know, citizens, you said someone simply was standing on his lawn and he got arrested, um, if at the time he knew his rights, and if that helps um, situations like that? Well, I think just to try to answer that quickly, part of the role of the Office of Police Complaints, and there is, I think, a full, at least one full-time staff person, is to go to local meetings, like the, um, like the commission that I used to be on, is to go to those meetings and talk about the work that the office does and help to educate people on their rights. Uh, look, civic educa education is obviously something that's very necessary in the country overall. But the Office of Police Complaints is uh, does have an outreach function. It's handled mainly by staff people. Of course, I would be happy, or the chairperson would be happy to do that. That was one of the questions we were asked about actually in our confirmation hearing. So, um, but you know, I have, there hasn't been a big role for that yet. Um, I did. I you know, I've done like some you know civic association panels and other things in Washington D.C. where we have talked about this sort of in light of George Floyd. But the education piece is definitely huge. And you know, the problem in, in that situation, I think that guy may have been aware of his rights. He was really just, you know, trying to ask a question or observe what happened. And I think the police officer just became way too, um, you know, way too aggressive. And then the other question was um, the makeup of your board, the review board. Oh, so our, our board is, so, you know, I'm, you know, so I, I'm on the board. There is uh, another uh, I guess there's another white man on the board who I believe is also a lawyer. He, I think, works for a union in D.C. Uh, there is another uh, white guy on the board. He, he also works, he works, I believe, for a police reform um, organization. 
Um, and there is a, um, there's a, there's a woman on the board who works in the DC government. I believe she's transgender. I think the, uh, the chair of the board is, um, is, is also gay. Um, and, you know, is gay. So we have some, we definitely have some diversity and the, um, the woman on the, uh, the woman, it's a female police officer, the commander for the first district, an African-American woman. So I'm the only black civilian member, you know, non-police uh, member of the board. And I, I think when, you know, you look at that, Washington, D.C., it's about 50 percent, you know, black. I think people would look at that. They tend to generally be surprised uh, that that's the case. You know, I don't I don't know. It's up to the mayor to appoint people. And, you know, usually I think a couple of people on the board might have been appointed by a previous mayor. So I can't really speak to how that happened. But I think it's pretty obvious that they expanded the board to nine people. There's an expectation that probably the next version of the board, uh, the additional people who come on, will probably help it look a little bit more, you know, representative, you know, of the city overall. I think, there, I don't know if there was a question there. I think there was a question for me about that. But, it's, but I really, I would just piggyback on what Jeff said in terms of in Connecticut, we really rely on decisions like how much community policing is going to be and, and civilian involvement. And then to your question in terms of education, a, a lot of that's going to be uh, on the backs of these civilian review boards, which we've now empowered every municipality to have. Those will be local appointments. I mean, Jeff's the entire model he's been talking about is frankly what we hope to emulate here in Connecticut on a town by town basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the other yeah. was based on community policing. Yeah, we, we don't we don't require community policing from a state law standpoint. We do leave that up to each municipality in terms of how much community policing they want. Um, you know, sort of that's going to be up to chiefs working with civilian review boards and local police commissions, et cetera, how they how they want to do something like that. It's not a that is not part of the state law. Interestingly enough. Yeah, I mean, these community policing, I think, has definitely been uh, something that, you know, approach that D.C. Has, has wanted to take under several different, you know, police chiefs. And there are officers out riding bicycles, walking around in the neighborhood. So I think there are a lot of, you know, positives in that regard. It probably varies by the individual officer. But I would certainly expect with the new police chief coming, there will be, you know, more emphasis on kind of building the community relationships. Um, one thing uh, in terms of the model, uh, Mike, it's great that that's what you're hoping for for Connecticut. I think that this model is better than some others out there. I, I just recently spoke with a guy who's uh, head Cincinnati's basically, you know, Office of Police Complaints, and there it's not an independent position. Like he's under one of the deputy mayors, and so I think you know when it comes to discipline and you know negotiating, he has to go through sort of a deputy mayor and a police chief to try to try to get something done so he does have a staff to do investigations and all but you know it, it becomes kind of inherently political when right. you're under the mayor under the deputy mayor and you know kind of negotiating with the police chief so uh, the, the independence to me is is a really uh, key portion of it yeah i think we've tried to recognize that both in terms of the inspector general's office but that's an excellent point I hadn't really thought about in terms of the civilian re review boards. I don't think we, frankly, gave enough structure in terms of how they're set up. We looked at different models, but we didn't dictate. And that is probably something, again, kind of a reason to have you come testify in Connecticut about this is a good model to use. And then we can put some parameters on civilian review, review boards from a state perspective for towns to adopt. We have not, in fairness, we have not done that. I think that's a a good follow-up point for us to do in Connecticut. Sounds sounds good. Yeah, I would happy be happy to share some thoughts on that, and definitely you know, and it would talk to our you know our chair as well to sort of get some thoughts because he'd previously worked under a different system in Milwaukee. So I you know it's definitely something I could talk about. I would, um, if I could just jump in really quick, I wanted to say, can anyone hear me? We're kind of this has been an excellent conversation between two sons of Connecticut <laughs> and they have brought up issues and they are clearly working together and that's a great news that's great news for all of us in this country 
That's the best kind of collaboration that we could have. Thank you both. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. Feel free to email us any questions, other questions. I circulated around the summary. I know Jeff sent his. If people have other questions, just send them along to us. We'll track, we'll, we'll get you an answer. Right. Exactly. Exactly. That my parents clearly have my email, so I am happy to uh, <laughs> respond to some via, e via the email as well. My dad's running a, a tight ship over here with the strict uh, six six p.m. cutoff. So, uh, but that is uh, that 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 is fine. So, no, thank you very much for uh, for having us. Thank you, Jeff. And now for next month, this has been a wonderful meeting. And guess what? For December, do you remember? For all the members of CAST, do you remember when we gave stipends to graduate students to become CAST member affiliates? Well, one of the fellows is all grown up now. And he emailed me and said he wants to give a talk to CAST. He's going to talk about something so esoteric, but he promised he would keep it simple for us dummies. So in December, we're going to hear from a former student who is now grown up and is going to come back and talk to us. Uh, I don't want to tell you what it is because you never tune in, but he's got a very interesting topic and he said that he can keep it simple for us stupid people. So tune in for next December's meeting and thank you, Mike, and thank you, Jeff. Jeff, I won't cut you out of my will. It's okay, I promise. <laughs> Very nice. That sounds great. All that right. Great. Bye, everyone. Stay well. Okay. Bye. You guys too. Stay well. Be safe. And Bye. Safe. And we will see you in December. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. <laughs> bye. -bye.